right, hello software engineers, welcome back. Picking up where we left off with validation and verification. If you haven't watched that video yet, watch it first. This is kind of the second half of that talk. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about testing uh, strategies and types. Um, we will get into actual testing examples with uh, Python, with the unit test library. Uh, using actual code examples uh, in the next video, but today we're just talking at a, at a high level uh, without any specific uh, code examples. We will get there, however. So broadly, testing is something you don't want to hunt and peck for. You don't want to guess the best cases. And, you know, when we talk about testing, one thing we have to realize is we feasibly can't test every input. Even for relatively simple numbers of inputs that are possible, because when we are talking about combinations of inputs, we're talking multiplication, our, the number of test cases grow exponentially, and that's always bad. Ex if you've taken algorithms yet, you know that. Exponential is just, it's never good. It's never good. Um, so to that end, how can we smartly decide how to test such that we can increase that certainty we talked about again not absolute certainty but but increase our certainty up to maybe maximal certainty uh that we've we found at least any critical defects so that we can fix them the first is we want to talk about strategies for testing and broadly testing falls into two strategies and i know there's three on the slide i'll feed you little birds hang around uh black box testing is when you test something without really looking at how it works. And an example of this is that many of you know how to drive a car, yet many of you may not actually know how a car works. You know that you turn the steering wheel to go left and right, you hit the pedal on the right to go faster, the pedal on the left to slow down, gear shift, key in the ignition, radio. You understand that when you turn the wheel left, the car should start to angle left. And when you press the pedal on the right, the car should start to go faster. You test those features based on what they should do, based on here's my input, this is the output I expect. Now that input is not just arguments to a function. If we're talking, say, unit testing, and we're testing a function. It can also be the state of a system. For example, if I turn the key in the ignition, but the state of the system that I'm testing is that the battery is dead, nothing will happen. Whereas if the battery is not dead, the car should start. And I can test those two cases independently. So we do take not just the input arguments, but also the state of the system into account when black box testing, as well as the state of the system after, not just what gets returned, but what side effects it creates. And, and we'll definitely get into examples of that with, um, with, with code examples on the next video. Uh, but with black box testing, the emphasis is on, we don't really care how something works, we care about what something does. Uh, by comparison with white box testing, we still test the same thing. We still care about the inputs, the outputs, the side effects, etc. We care about the state of the system. But the difference is we, we design our tests with knowledge of how the code works. In fact, explicitly taking into account the code. For example, do you cover, does, do you have at least one test that covers every if else branch? Do you have at least one test that uh, for a given loop bypasses, never enters the loop because the condition's initially false? Things like that are what we take into account when we're talking white box testing. Are we actually testing uh, all the lines of code? Is there any dead code, etc.? Gray boxes is, so I said there are two strategies, even though there's three. Gray boxes, as you would expect, in between black and white. Broadly, we think of it similar to black box testing, but we have some knowledge of the internals. The tester has some knowledge. 
They may not have specific knowledge about lines of code, but they may know, okay, this function calls this function or this function uses this library or calls this sub component, whatever. So there is some knowledge, but intentionally not perfect knowledge. So think of it, um, black box, again, we don't care how it's written. Does it work? White box. We do care, obviously, that it works, but we also care about testing all lines of code. Do we have any dead code that hasn't been tested? Because there, there be dragons. We may not know if there's untested code what that code can do. If we haven't tested it, we don't know what it does. It may work. It may make things explode. It, it, somewhere between working and explosions is typically where untested code falls. Uh, including including uh, uh, working in explosions. Typically, not to either extreme. Gray box, again, we design, uh, we design tests knowing that some component X was used to write a function. So how can we test that particular function with the understanding that, X, that component X is used? So these are our testing strategies. And I want to be clear that when we're talking... Testing strategies versus testing types. Testing strategies are overarching ideas that we can use to build any type of test. Testing types are testing we do at different stages of development uh, with different levels of interaction from the, the ultimate stakeholders, etc. So we're talking about testing types. We're more talking about scale or about where in the process we are. It's the stress. So, you, for instance, you can do unit testing in a black box way and a white box way. You can do integration testing in a black box way, a white box way. So these are these are two different dimensions to think of. Unit testing. We test on the level of individual functions. You've probably gone over this in twenty one ten. I know I have taught many of you in twenty one ten, but I know I haven't taught everyone. Um, but unit testing was likely discussed. We're going to go over what the expectations of how to unit test well is in the next video. Uh, we'll talk a lot about it here in a bit. Uh, integration testing. Can we combine multiple components together uh, and, and test their interactions to make sure they're working? Um, the system testing is viewing the system as a whole. Uh, a good example would be you might test a, a single function. If you were testing a car, you might test a single function to unit test. You might test the radio combined with the sound system to make sure those are working together in integration testing. And you would actually run the whole car, radio and all, to the system testing. Acceptance testing is, hey, customer, here's our product. No one saw that. Hey, customer, here's our product. Here it is. And... We think it's ready for you to give us money for. Do you like it? And the customer gives it a thumbs up or thumbs down. It, it, think like Gladiator, but chances are they're not going to be as great an actor as Joaquin Phoenix. Anyway, they're going to say, yes, we accept the software. No, we don't. Uh, beta testing is, it, it, it will sound similar to acceptance testing. And by the way, the term beta testing has been really skewed uh, by the video game industry, but it, to some extent, the term's apropos. A lot of times it's arguably more advertisement than it is a, a beta testing. A beta test is when non-developers test the system uh, and provide feedback on it, but it is not a release. You are not going to release the software based on the result of the beta test. You're just getting feedback. Um, Regression testing, that is making sure that as you add things, things don't break. So we're going to spend the bulk of the next bit talking about unit testing, and then we'll come back to the other. So unit testing. This is testing a single function that takes an input, not just argument, but the system state, the input, and verifies the output. Not just what gets returned, but the system state. And it's typically verified using assert functions. So the idea is you can do things like assert true or assert equals on all these different fields, parameters, whatever. And then uh, after you, um, sorry, my chair is a bit wobbly here. 
after you check those assertions, if they all hold up, the test passes. If any single assertion fails, you assert something is true and it's false. You assert two things are equal and they're not. Test fails. And the reason that is, is it gets to this idea of expected and actual output. Now, often when we design our unit tests, we may have some setup process that involves creating all the variables we're going to use, prepares the test environments. We then execute the single function we intend to test. You call that function once, you run some assert statements, and then you tear down. Um, so a testing suite, by the way, a test suite, it's a group of tests. So where um, a single unit test tests one function, tests the output, a testing suite is your group of unit tests for that larger piece of uh, functionality. Not just for one function, but maybe all the functions in a given class, for example. Individual unit tests are fundamentally black box. Um, individual unit tests do not worry about what exactly is in the code. They focus on the inputs and the outputs. Um, testing suites, however, as a group, as a group can be considered gray box or white box. Every individual test is black box. It's concerned with the inputs and the outputs. What tests we decide to create is often informed not just by black box thinking, but also white box thinking. That is, we want to design tests to make sure we're getting code coverage. That test by itself is still black box. It doesn't care about how the code's written. But the motivation that creates that test, that is white box oriented. We do care about what's in the code. So unit tests are written by the developer during development. I want to be clear on this. This is something I deal with a lot in, in, in when, I, when I teach 2110 and intro programming is that if we say something like you're required to write tests, I will hear the following. Well, I finished the assignment. It took me so long to do. I don't have time to write all these tests. And therein lies the problem. There's a great adage in engineering. Minutes or uh, minutes of planning can be saved by doing hours of work. It's a tongue-in-cheek expression that often points out the fallacy that engineering thinking people, and that includes computer scientists and software engineers such as yourselves, uh, we love to get our hands dirty. We love to get in and just start doing stuff and, you know, seeing what happens and combining things and, you know, just playing with the code until something works. That That's fun, right? Testing, ah, oh, that's boring. I don't wanna. Well, the thing is, if you do the testing, your development will be faster. And, and I know that's like saying, oh, if you eat enough vegetables, then they'll taste just like candy. Ah, oh, yay. But it's actually true. So generally, you want to do test-driven development, and you should at least know what this term is, but you should really practice this. The idea of test-driven development is that you write a test at a black box level that says, hey, this is what the system should do. This input produces this output when I call this function. Then you write enough code to make that test pass. Then... Once that test passes, you write another test that implements some related functionality to that function. And you write enough code so it passes. And you write a test, write a little code. Write a test, write a little code. And you may be thinking, that sounds like such a waste of time. Because if my code works, then me testing it is just wasting time. Well, here's the thing. Your code's not going to always work. I've been doing this half my life, and I still... I still use equals instead of equals equals sometimes. Your code is not always going to work. And when you do unit testing as you build, when you do test-driven development, you're going to catch that very, very quickly. If you build out the whole system and then say, oh, finally, oh, I don't want to, I'll just, I'll just write some quick tests. And, oh no, now the tests aren't working. Well, what's wrong now? Well, what's wrong is your function had that same mistake I talked about. Use equals instead of equals equals. Now you got a problem. 
hey, you got a serious problem. You got to find that. But you've written hundreds of lines of code. How long is it going to take you to find that? If you did unit testing when you were at the function, no time at all. Afterwards? See, the thing is, debugging code... It, it does not grow linearly. If you double the size of the program, it takes significantly longer than twice the time to find the bug. So you really, really should, like, I know, we're, we're, we're telling you, like, you got to eat your vegetables. They'll the, the help you grow big and strong. But you got to unit test. And, and by the way, I will fully admit that the first time you start doing this, it's going to take longer. It, most likely, it's going to take longer. But here's why. Because you're not good at unit testing yet if you haven't been doing it. Now, I know, I know many people in this class have, but if you haven't forced yourself to practice, you know, it's like trying to ride a bicycle for the first time. It's really hard. You have to force yourself to keep practicing even when it's not going well. But once you get good at it, it's second nature. And it's a much faster way to get around. Nailed that analogy, right? Nailed it. But it is. Once you get into the habit of forcing yourself to test alongside the development, in test-driven development, I promise you, you will become a more proficient and efficient programmer. You will spend much less time debugging, which, let's be honest, is the worst part of the process. No one likes debugging code. No one at all. I don't like debugging code. I teach intro programming. Half my job is debugging code. And I would say it's why I'm bald, but I was actually bald in my 20s. So it's why I have even less hair. Anyway. Yes, unit cust testing means nothing to the customer. But you'll have less defects and they'll get their product faster. They care about that. The point is unit testing gives you more confidence the code works. It gives you that more certainty. We talked about how certainty is not you're either certain or you're uncertain. It is a scale. You go from not sure at all to eh, probably to, okay, I'm fairly sure to. I'm as sure as I can reasonably be. Now, again, we can never prove our code has no bugs. Get that out of your head. You're never going to prove your code is bug free because it can't be done. You can't prove the absence of something. But you can be as sure as you can be that you found any critical defects. And unit testing dramatically improves that confidence. So, done trying to convince you now how to unit test, take a requirement, feature, function, whatever, before you write the code and consider how you will know if you succeeded. What variables will change? What objects will change? What state of the system will change? And then write that test. And then write the code to make that test work. Then write the next test, write the next code. Back and forth, back and forth. That is test-driven development. What makes a unit test? Again, we have a setup. We, we put the state into a test condition. That may involve directly changing variables. Let's say we're testing an object. You may directly change the values of an object to put it into a state that it will likely be in real running before you call the function and then ensure that what you expect to happen happens. So you set up, you put the system into the state that you want it to be in, then you execute the test and you describe what will the test do. That is broken up. Uh, from there, we can describe the results of the test. So what, what actions does the test take? What functions do we call with what inputs, etc.? Then the expected. What should happen? And all of this can be done based on spec, based on the specifications, based on the requirements. You do not need to write code to list these things. And if you do do these things before writing code, congrats, that is black box testing. From there... You run the test and you get the actual results. And what we want is the actual and the expected to match. Actual and expected match, yay, test passes. If the actual and the expected don't match, uh-oh, we have a problem. That's a failure. And that means we need to figure out 
What's wrong? Is the test wrong? Is the code wrong? How is it wrong? How do we fix it? And then from there, you can reset the testing environment to do more testing with. Um, so from there, I'm going to talk about these libraries in the next video, Py, uh, PyTest Unit Test Library. We'll get into that. There are some lovely links here that will be linked uh, on the website as well as in the slides, which will be released, uh, as well as in the description of this video. Check it out. So an example test might be something like you name some test IDs. You can describe these at the level of spec before you even write any code, before you create any objects at all. Then once you've actually started to build some objects, you start to have variables, etc., you can add to this description to say the precondition. Game is in test mode. Game board, is, game board object is loaded. The game has begun. The number of players is two. Player dice roll equals three. Similarly, you can describe your test cases in this level of detail. Again, you do need to have created for this level of detail some objects and some variables, but you certainly don't need to have implemented the function that you are testing here. You define what you expect to happen, and then you actually run the code to determine what does happen. And you want these columns to match up. You want your test to pass. What makes a good test? Again, you can't test every value. So you pick some key areas. You do equivalence partitioning. That is, you take a problem and you break it up into similar groups. For example, if you were testing an absolute value function, the positive numbers behave very differently than the negative numbers, right? Absolute value four and absolute value three for positive four, positive three, those don't really behave differently, right? Whereas absolute value of negative four, negative three, well, that produces positive four, positive three. Those behave differently from the inputs that are a positive number. So those are, but if you test absolute value positive four, you don't really need to test five, six, seven, etc., Because they're going to behave largely the same. So you want to cover every equivalence group at least once. And then you want to sp pay special attention to boundaries between those equivalence groups, like zero and positive one and negative one. You want to pay special attention to those spaces. Uh, from there, some white or gray box oriented testing would be doing things like decision tests, making sure that you're testing down different paths of if and else. If you go down if with one test, make sure you go down else with another. Uh, exception testing, actually test to make sure that when the system is in an erroneous state, that it actually throws the correct exception or correct error. That is, it's actually valuable to test crashes. The system should crash when X happens because X should never happen. That's especially true if you're designing, say, an API library. You want to do defensive programming, and so you're going to add in things like exceptions intentionally. So a quote from Donald Knuth, and he's, he's fantastic with language, this guy. Uh, my test programs are intended to break the system, to push it to its extreme limits, to pile complication on complication in ways that the system programmer never consciously anticipated. To prepare such test data, I get into the meanest, nastiest frame of mind that I can manage. And I write the cruelest code that I can think of. Then I turn around and embed that in even nastier constructions that are almost obscene. <laughs> he's, he's a little bit, I, I love how colorful the language can be. The point is, and this gets back to what I talked about, you cannot prove your code works. That's not what testing does. Those defects are out there. You just haven't found them yet. And testing is the act of hunting them down, finding them, grabbing them, identifying them, and fixing them. You are a hunter. You're not just waiting for your code to work. You're going out there and you're making it work by getting those defects. That's the mindset to have while testing. So we'll do a guided practice. Uh, sorry, a slide is out of order. Um, 
So we'll we'll do a guided practice on test design. How do we design tests for the purpose of trying to find defects uh, in class on uh, Thursday, as well as you can work independently. It's actually going to be guided practice E. We'll talk about that when it comes out. Um, but one question asked is, when do you run your tests? All the time, locally, as you're coding, you should continuously run your tests. And as you add new tests, you should keep running those too. Every time that you are about to commit to the, or, or especially if you're about to merge to production, you should do testing as part of continuous integration. All those unit tests that you write, never throw them away. They're always going to be useful because they test an important idea. And you can bring those tests together as a greater test suite to serve as regression testing. Regression testing is when, and it's mainly black box and it's mainly automated. It's when we run all the tests that at least are still considered um, relevant to the final product. If we remove a feature, then obviously some of those tests will be removed as well. Uh, if we radically change a feature, we may change some of those tests. But otherwise, every unit test that's been written on any piece of code that's still in the system, we keep that around. And when someone is about to commit, we run all those tests. So like if you were committing to an open source project and you said, I just implemented this high demand feature and I'm, and I'm submitting it, take my pull request, please, and integrate it into production so I can say I contributed to this product. They're going to run their regression tests. And if any one of them fail, they're going to say, no, no, thanks. No, we don't want it. If it's maybe one or two, you know, and it's otherwise a great commit, maybe they work with you. But most likely for the really large open source projects, they're not going to bother because they don't have the time. And that's to make sure that a new feature does not break old features or already functioning features. So whenever we're about to release, we're going to run our regression test. Make sure that this doesn't break anything that previously worked. So going back to our list of testing types, and obviously we spent uh, a disproportionate amount of time talking about unit testing. We've now talked about regression testing, which is linked. And by the way, regression testing can also be done with integration and system, which we'll talk about in a second. These four, the top three here in regression are very developer focused testing and they're very verification based. Does the system do the thing that the developers intended to do correctly? Does it function correctly? Did we build it right? Whereas acceptance and beta testing, yes, verification is important, but they're much more customer facing. And so they're much more validation focused as well. Did we build the right system? Did we build the system the customer wants? So now on to integration testing. Integration testing uh, links to unit testing. And it can be black, gray, or white. It doesn't matter. Usually, tests are written separately from any one component. Rather, tests are designed for how two components interact. And in a case where integration testing, proper integration testing, could have been really valuable is the Mars Climate Orbiter, where one system produced an amount of thrust to generate in English units, and the other system delivered that number, because, hey, it's a float, so it must be right, that number, but they assumed that that number was in metric units. So it under delivered thrust, it under corrected to, to widen its orbit and it burnt up in the Martian atmosphere. So it is based upon agreed upon APIs and interactions and making sure those work. And we should also run these during uh, continuous integration. And it is also part of regression testing. Uh, system testing, this is entirely black box focused because usually at that point the system is large enough or complex enough in code that, you know, we, we generally rely on small scale. We'll look at white box, but at the, at the scale we're talking about, it's just not possible to measure every combination of every system on even what we would consider small, simple programs. And the idea is we're end to end testing the product. We're testing the entire product as a single unit. And it usually follows some written test plan. Um, you know, something like uh, if I'm testing, say, a website, 
I log into the website. I go to this page. I click this button. A form pops up. I type in these three things. I hit run. I check to make sure that what I just entered gets processed by the server by checking this web page, etc. It is testing the whole system. So often these are not written in automated code, although you can automate uh, system testing, uh, of course, in some cases. But often it is based on testing the user story. You remember those user stories? You wrote on the front, this is what the user wants. You wrote on the back, and here's how we make sure that we implement that. Here's how we test it. That's the thing you test, the back of the note card. You run that story. Beta testing, uh, this is putting the product in front of the customer. It is gray box testing because there is usually someone there familiar with the system. But for those testing the system, the, the customers, or at least stand-ins that are designed to think or act like the customers, uh, they, for them it's black box. They only care about what the system does. So oftentimes the other developers or uh, some subset of intended users are going to perform some set of actions, you know, use this website to do blank while being monitored by people familiar with the system, not familiar with necessarily the code level, but at least familiar enough that they can be useful in possibly identifying what systems are defective if and when defects occur. Uh, the difference between beta and alpha testing. Beta has some subset of non-developers, uh, whereas alpha testing, it's all generally in-house. It's all people in the know who, who understand um, the system. They're, they're people generally very close to the system. Acceptance testing, as we said, you put it in front of the customer. It's entirely black box because the customer doesn't care how the, how much code you have. They paid you to write the code because they couldn't write it themselves and they didn't want to write it themselves. So they only care about what the system does. So this is similar to system testing, but the, it's kind of the opposite side of the coin where this is from the customer perspective. So when we're talking system testing, we're verifying against the specifications from the developer specifications. That is, this is what the system should do. Whereas the user is, and it says verif verifying against the original requirements, but you can think of this as validating that the system meets their original requirements. Maybe not even the ones in the document, but just their ideas. This is what I want software to do. So that is the different types of testing. And that is, um, some description of unit testing, we're gonna get to some code examples in the next video. But in the meantime, um, I hope you enjoyed these videos. Always open to feedback. If you have any questions, don't be afraid. Jump into Discord, post in general, ask on Piazza, any such thing, and we'll, we'll certainly be happy to answer. And with that, uh, it is Friday for me. I doubt many of you are watching the video on a Friday night. Although then again, none of us can go anywhere anyway. Bad. Um, but, I hope you did enjoy it, and I will see you in class Tuesday. Have a great weekend and take care.